Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting to discuss key issues facing our nation. Dialogue with Lytton brings you closer to your government and Washington closer to you. great to see the number of people that are here. How many? We've been doing this now for four years. I wonder if I could see a show of hands of those who have attended five or more of these meetings. That's great. Now, how about a show of hands of those that are attending their first dialogue tonight, today? That's great, too. That's great. Somebody said this must be a democratic rally. I remember we had Hubert Humphrey here and we asked how many were independents or Republicans. And maybe we can get a show of hands on that today. Independents or Republicans. I'm looking at some folks that aren't being very honest. because I know better. <laughs> Just great to have this many here. We have a, a busload that came in all the way from Springfield and Joplin. Would they stand up? Let's recognize them, wherever they are. Springfield and Joplin. four years we've had dialogue. We've had a lot of very interesting guests. We've had five presidential candidates sitting here in this chair, including uh, Hubert Humphrey and Jimmy Carter, Lloyd Benson, Mo Udall, Scoot Jackson. We've had members of the president's cabinet here and uh, leaders of the Senate and the House and Kyle Albert and uh, Shirley Chisholm and, and others. But today we have a special guest, not a leader of the House or the Senate, not a leader in the campaign for presidents of the United States, but the leader of my household. The mother of our children, my wife, and the one who served as manager of my first two campaigns, and serving as treasurer of this one, one who has been shaking hands and campaigning on her own throughout the state ever since school got out. And I thought it would be well, in view of the questions raised about life in Washington, and the interest in knowing the candidate, the family behind the candidate better, that that's the kind of a guest we ought to have on this dialogue. Won't you please welcome someone I cherish and adore, my wife. Sure. Welcome to Dialogue. It's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get to see you much, so it's good to be here. <laughs> I was asked Monday uh, when I was going to see my wife, and I said, well, I don't know. She's my guest on Dialogue next Sunday, I know. <laughs> Somebody introduced me last week, and they said that I was gone so much that uh, uh, Linda came to the door and went into the kitchen and said to, to Sharon that uh, it was Daddy. And uh, Sharon turned around and said, what channel's he on? <laughs> Let's get started. We have microphones scattered around the room. If you have a question, uh, just come to the mic, give your name, where you're from, and we'll try to respond in a frank way. No doubt you've discussed long hours before you started into campaigning and politics in general. What were your dreams for the United States? What were the dreams for the people of Missouri, and in particular the 6th District and so on, that you thought great enough to give up a lot of time with your family, with yourself, and your own personal ambitions to go out and campaign to help us. What were those dreams that you hadn't dreamed for us? 
Well, that's a good question, and I'll let Sharon respond to my, my feeling is very simple. Uh, I'm very, very interested in government, history, politics, always have been. The thing that's disturbed me the most is the fact that we don't really seem to have representative government. And yet that's the principle on which this country was founded. If you go back and study the records of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and those who founded this great democracy of ours, you'll find that they were planters, they were farmers, they were businessmen. Thomas Jefferson, after being sworn in as president of the United States, went down to the local pub to eat uh, an hour later and uh, had to wait for an hour or so to get a table. And he was like them, he was one of them. And uh, we seem to have lost that today. We have far too many professional politicians uh, that, that have been in politics all their life. And uh, we talk about representative government. Well, we really don't have representative government. To have it representative, they've got to be able to understand our feelings and our concerns. We need more farmers, businessmen, homemakers, housewives, people from the real world serving in public office so they can represent us. You don't have to be hungry to understand those who are hungry, but it helps. Uh, you don't have to have had a crop failure or, or lost your, 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 your crop to understand the problems of the farmer. But that too helps. Neither do you have to fill out dozens of forms every day to understand the problems <coughs> of businessmen, but that too helps. And we have so many in government who've done nothing but government that they can't relate to understand the problems of real people. My two opponents in this race, for example, uh, both of them went to law school, got right out of law school, went right into public bureaucracy, either elected or appointed position. And uh, they're trying to represent us. They've never run a business, met a payroll, owned a farm. They've been in the government all their lives. And in my opinion, that's the reason why we have lost confidence in our government, because our government is not us. It's not us at all. It's not made up of real people. It's made up of plastic politicians and professional bureaucrats. All they know is government, and that's why we have too much of it, in my opinion. I might further add to that that I think also that it would be good to, because we are planning on extending our dialogue program and sharing it with the people of Missouri and because we, we would like for them to feel like we feel with you all. We feel close and uh, we know you're our friends and this is what we would like to do statewide is to bring the government closer to the people so that we can talk and know what the people feel and we feel that we'll both be better off. I would like to hear the congressman express okay, his ideas on national health care and also how it might be financed. I do not support the Kennedy Common National Health Insurance Program. I do feel this about national health insurance, as I do about all forms of aid to people that need to be helped. And that is that we need to do a better job of helping those that need to be helped and not do so much helping of those who ought not be helped. And the best example I can give is in the area of health care. We've discussed this to some extent in programs of the past. That is that, let's take a woman that's 70, 75 years old. She needs dentures. Now, any country that can go as far as we've gone and do as much as we have done can provide dentures for somebody over 70. The idea being, that they wouldn't ask for them, they didn't need them. If they got them, they take care of them. They can't work because of their age. It's obvious they need help. They're not being helped. We're helping other people that uh, shouldn't be helped. The same thing's true with hearing aids. Same thing's true with glasses. You see, we all say we want to help everybody willing to help themselves, but we have specific instances where we're not doing that. Glasses and hearing aids and dentures are prime examples of things that need to go to people that can't help themselves that would take care of what they got. Nobody would want glasses that they could see, hearing aids that they could hear, or dentures that they could chew. And the fact that they're over 70 or whatever their age might be is a clear example that they can't go out and work. We know that. And we're not helping these people. So I think these are people that clearly need to be helped. I guess what I'm saying is, I can support most of the provisions of the Long Ribicoff Bill, which provide for assistance for the elderly, which also make provisions for the poor and the working poor but that broad spectrum in betwixt and between, except for catastrophic insurance, I think are fully capable of looking out for themselves. Thank you.
might add with catastrophic insurance, I had the occasion to visit with a gentleman the other day that's selling, uh, I think, used cars, and he sold a used car to a gentleman who said, now, yes, I want I you to know that a few weeks ago, I had to file bankruptcy. And the reason he filed bankruptcy is they had two children, and they lost one of the girls, and the other girl had been very ill. And the hospital expenses were so great uh, that this couple lost their home, lost their furnishings, lost their television, lost all of their assets, all of their money. They lost everything. And there was a time in this country when if your children were ill, you could take them down to the doctor and not know that you were going to lose everything you had in paying the bill. And that's why I think we do need some form of catastrophic insurance to provide for the protection of the American citizen from losing all that he has with a major illness. The minor <laughs> ones, I, I, I think that we can uh, protect ourselves for and, and take care of. But the major ones, I don't think we can. Senior citizens need to be helped, and the poor that have no other means by which to provide for themselves need to be helped. A couple of questions. First off, I've read in a uh, uh, Springfield paper recently, I believe, and also heard some uh, news reports that the uh, Symington uh, uh, people have uh, requested that uh, your uh, dialogue uh, show with uh, Jimmy Carter not be shown. What's the uh, decision at this time? I want to be able to tell the people when I get home. All right. Mr. Symington has been most anxious to see the dialogue has not been aired for some time. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to take my feelings on the issues to the people. And I would suggest that if he spent as much time telling the people where he stood, as I am, instead of trying to stop me from telling the people where I stand, he'd be better off. Then I can go home and tell them that it will be on Monday evening or whenever it is. Let me say this. <laughs> Mr. Symington, I understand, has been in touch with the Carter camp to try to get them to not permit me to run the program tonight, which will be aired in Kansas City. I think the best thing for you to do is to stay over a little bit, turn on the TV, because tonight you'll watch it. <laughs> I'm Ralph Anderson, Guy, Missouri, Clinton County, and I would like to ask about what we've been hearing about Social Security. If the like program is in mm -hmm. financial trouble like we've heard so much about. Social Security from an accounting standpoint is bankrupt today because it can only meet about 2% of its obligation if indeed there was no more money coming in. Uh, what happened? Well, it started by Roosevelt, 35, funded in 39. By 1946, we had a 17-year supply of money in Social Security. Today, there's less than eight months supply in Social Security. The question is, what happened? People are living longer. Yes. Longevity of the average American has increased. They're drawing more out, more years. Reproduction in this country has dropped down. The desire to have uh, nine or ten in a family is no longer there. And consequently, fewer people are being born and entering the workforce. So we have fewer going in and paying in, more living longer and drawing out on the other end. Then we have an unemployment of 7.3%, over 7 million Americans not working, not paying into the system. That hopefully will be changed. Uh, we changed the inflation index in the structure so as to pay out more than was paid in to offset inflation, and that took a big cut out of the system. And lastly, I think our government uh, has placed too many programs in Social Security that ought never have been funded by that trust. That trust is and should be pure. It should be funded only for Social Security, nothing else. And I think that's one of the first changes we've got to make is to Tell the American people that when you put money in Social Security, it'll stay there and be used for that and that alone and not be drained off for some other purpose. Prime example of how it's been used for other things is Medicare. Our politicians took a look at Medicare and said it's a great program. Sure would be nice to give it to the people if we didn't have to charge them for it. And they looked around and said there's a trust fund, Social Security, a lot of money there. Why not just fund it out of Social Security? And that's what they did. It's cost our trust fund 12 billion dollars a year for Medicare. That's one of the reasons why it's in trouble right now. And I introduced legislation last month to fund Medicare out of general revenue 
instead of Social Security. That'll save us about $12 billion a year. And I might add, I'm introducing legislation on Medicare also that will change the benefits so that young people uh, do not, uh, are not encouraged or are not required to put their parents in a nursing home to qualify them for Medicare, which, which doesn't make sense either, if you stop and think about it. So let's make that change, number one. That'll save us one third of our loss. Number two, I'm hoping we can get that unemployment down to an acceptable rate. That'll save us perhaps the other third. Now, picking up the final third of the loss is much more difficult because the options are not very feasible from a political standpoint. What options are there? One, cut back benefits, not politically uh, acceptable because the politicians won't vote for it. Number two is to increase the age, retirement from 65 to be raised to 67 or 68. Not practical from a political standpoint. Number three would be to raise the amount of money that goes into the system. Now it's 5.85% of your income. If we, if we raise just that to save the system, we'd have to raise it to between 12 and 13% of your income. That's not uh, acceptable because that would make the working man pay more to Social Security than he did state and federal income tax. So the last option is the one that probably would be picked up, in my opinion, and that's to lift the lid. Instead of paying in on the first 15300 pay in on the first 18, 19, or 20,000. Now, those who are making 15 to 20,000 are not going to look upon that as being an acceptable option either. But I would suggest that from a political standpoint that it's the most practical and probably is the one that will be relied on. Those three things, reducing unemployment, taking other systems and programs out of Mer Medicare to purify it, and third, lifting the lid would be the way I would go at solving the problems of Social Security what the other 434 congressmen, other 100, uh, in this case, I hope 99 senators, uh, would do, I don't know. That's what I'd do. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. I'm Bill Powell from Princeton, Missouri, and I'm interested in the campaign. I haven't heard enough questions on that today, and I'd like to have some answers on it. Uh, everything that uh, we wanted Hearns to do, he's done. Um, <laughs> He's, he's devoted his time to telling everybody about the grand jury investigation, and uh, we're pleased that he wants to focus on that. Uh, we don't have to. Um, we're pleased that Jim Symington has, uh, uh, has run on his name. That way we don't have to and, and don't have to focus on it. Uh, we were fearful that he would go out and campaign vigorously and show people what a hard worker he was. He didn't. We don't have to focus on it. Uh, <laughs> Everything that we wanted them to do, they've done. And I think it's very nice of them and very accommodating. And uh, I've been in a good many towns to speak for the seventh, eighth, and ninth time in the last six months where those candidates have yet to make one speech. And in the time that remains, they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, I've been at Plant Gates morning after morning for four months. Sharon's been at Plant Gates uh, 5.30 and 6, and neither one of us are the best to campaigners at 5 a.m., let me convey to you. But we've done it. They haven't. Uh, that's behind us, and they can't do it now. So everything we have done is, has gone according to what we hoped would happen. They haven't done these things, and uh, I'm glad they didn't. We've tried to establish an image in this campaign as being a person who understands the feelings of the people as being one who's willing to work, as being one who wants to earn the seat and not inherit it, as being one with a new idea, as a new way of doing things. They'll either like it or they won't. There's no way we can change that. I might make one little comment. Uh, while I was out traveling this last week, and I went into a radio station to do an interview, and uh, Mr. Symington was in the same town at the same time that I was, and he had been to the radio station previously, just before me and had done an interview. And uh, I thought it was quite interesting that the man that did interviewed me also interviewed Mr. Symington. And Mr. Symington had left him a sheet of music. And I said, well, I want to leave you our sheet of issues. And I hope you catch the difference. <laughs> Ms. Geraldine Oatman from Rockport, Missouri, and I would like to ask Mrs. Litton, what is the average day like of a congresswoman's wife? 
Well, I would imagine there's probably 535 different answers for that <laughs> for each woman who has a husband in the House or the Senate. Um, I have been active in my husband's office, and so my day is pretty much getting the children and Jerry up and running them to school and then getting Jerry off and then going back home and putting me back together and then going down to the office and working so many hours. and. Uh, then I try and get home about the time the children are back from school so that make sure they do their lessons and practice their piano and what have you and uh, get dinner and uh, wait for him to come home, which sometimes is sort of late. <laughs> Introduce my family. I guess I could do that. You've probably, many of you have seen them on their doorstep, on your doorsteps in the first congressional race because uh, my son indicated the other day that he was ready to go back out and campaign. He said one of the good things about campaigning is daddy would tell me now just two more blocks of houses and we get a nice cream cone. <laughs> and he suggested we ran that first campaign on ice cream. <laughs> Scott Litton, 12 years old. You want to stand up, Scott? My daughter is uh, 13 when she visited the White House and uh, had the occasion to sit down in the chair of the president. Uh, she was very excited about it. She came home and that night I asked her about it and she said that uh, it was exciting. I said, how did you feel sitting in the president's chair? What did you say? She said, I slammed on his desk and I said, up with allowances and down with toy prices. <laughs> Linda, do you want to stand up after that? <laughs> and my mom and dad, I think most of you know, because they're, they're the people that I go to for my source of inspiration and, and energy. And, and uh, anybody who has the fortune of having parents uh, such as I, surely would be challenged to seek to serve the public because one couldn't possibly work as hard as you'd be inspired to work for yourself if you had them as parents. And they worked hard all their lives. And uh, if we had other people as fortunate as I in having parents that worked as hard as they have, Take the it. kind of faith in their country and mankind as they have, I think we'd have a much, a much better country. Anytime I have problems, I think back to the problems they had in their lifetime realize that mine are small indeed, and that gives me the kind of courage to go on and to accept my problems being very minor. But uh, their role in my life has been very major, my mom and dad. And every, they say every candidate has a, a mother-in-law standing back saying, he ain't really like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I have one that, that's been very kind and very supportive of me, and a father-in-law uh, that has been equally as supportive. As a matter of fact, for the last few days and weeks, they've been in the Ozark area of the state of Missouri campaigning for me. And we rather thought that if a mother-in-law would be out working for you, that that's about the height of a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Cliff Somerville. <laughs> You can't see them? Scott and Leonard, you want to stand up here? They're going to both shoot you and I for this. You know that? Okay. We have a question right here. Uh, I don't have a question, Jerry, but uh, I want to take this opportunity to encourage everybody to vote August 3rd. If we don't vote, we just will not have an election. And I, th I think if, if all of us will encourage and then invite all of our neighbors to be sure and vote, I've run across a lot of people that are not even registered. And I'm satisfied the rest of us have got neighbors and friends. But what we need to do is to vote August the 3rd, and I 
want to take this opportunity to thank you for the many hours and uh, hard work that you put in on this dialogue with Lytton. Thank you. I certainly have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask you your views on gun control? All right. This is a question for my husband, who isn't able to be here. I'm a hunter. I have a gun. Uncle Sam doesn't know I have it. That's the way I want it to stay. Thank yeah. you very much. You know, we were talking about, we've been talking about all these problems. We've had some good questions today. And somebody said, aren't you really worried and concerned about the, the health of our country with all the problems we have? And I told him a story that I enjoy telling of the farmer from Missouri that went to Texas. And he met this big rancher who had this big operation. And the Texan asked him how big his farm was. He told him, about 300 acres. Then he made the mistake of asking the Texan how big his farm was. The Texan said, well, let me put it this way. He said, you can get in my pickup truck and you can drive it all day and never get off my spread. And the Missouri farmer said, I had a pickup like that once before. <laughs> so we've had these problems before and I think we'll get over them. But uh, I just want to know if you, the, both of you are straight party people. Where you go, get them. No. So then, why do you, do you feel um, that Symington would be a better man for Missouri over Danforth, and why? Not necessarily because he's a Democrat. Okay, then that's what I'd like to know. Why do you feel that he is a better man for us Missourians? I'll express my feelings toward Symington and Danforth after August 3. In the meantime, I think I'm better than both of them. <laughs> I'm Robert Wagley, Mayor of Liberty, Missouri. I've been in contact with you for the last six months on the revenue sharing program, which is very vital to all the cities and municipalities in the United States. I want to say one thing. Last Friday, I received a letter from you after the bill has been passed. You informed me in the letter that you made a point to be in Washington, D.C. when this bill came on the floor and your opponent, Mr. Symington, who is supposed to be representing the people, didn't show up to even vote on the bill. And, if I, and I think that you are showing that you're supporting the people when you be in Washington to vote on a vital bill as a revenue sharing, which is the backbone to all the communities in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've run out of time, and the time has gone quickly again. I do want to thank everybody for being here and for meeting uh, as we have month after month after month for four years. We will have dialogue with Lytton again next month. And at that time, I'll either be a congressman on his way out or a senator on the way in. And I hope that you come, participate as you've done today, as you've done for the last four years. If you can't come, I hope that you tune in on television throughout the state of Missouri as we continue to bring government to the people. Thank you very much. You've been watching Dialogue with Lytton, now in its fourth year of taking government to the people. If you believe as Jerry Lytton believes, if you like his open approach to government, if you would like him as your U.S. Senator, ask for a Democratic ballot on August 3rd and vote Jerry Lytton for U.S. Senator. He's the kind of man we need for the kind of America we want. Vote August 3rd, Jerry Litton, U.S. Senator. <laughs>